I think when people start into the space or any space, the whole, like your headspace goes into, I need to have the best of everything to be the best at everything. And I think that's a trap. It's a scam. You can pretty much do whatever you'd like to do with the things that you have and then invest into things as you're growing. The following podcast is an American Influencer Council production. Welcome to Creators with Influence, a podcast on the intersection between the creator economy and digital culture, where entrepreneurs come to share empowered stories. Kiana smith Brunito is a creator advocate, champion of lifelong learning, and movement maker. Karsten Tannis, known as Skinny Was Here, is a solopreneur, internationally recognized multimedia creator, and a promoter of creative inclusivity. Together, Together they, they are, are your, your hosts. hosts. So we're back at it for another episode of Creators with Influence, and it's great to see you, Karsten. Always a pleasure to see you, Kiana. And today we have a very special guest. We have Mariam Ishiak who is a career creator, who is passionate about everything that she does. Creativity has no bounds and she always infuses her culture and her heritage into what she is doing. So tell us a little bit more about Miriam for the listeners that are on the podcast with us today. Yes, Miriam has uh, an extraordinary background. She is a food creator. She's tapped into product development. She has a jewelry line. She's illustrated a child's book. And she is also known for her beauty content as well. She's a multidimensional creator. And um, I would say that she's a woman who doesn't want to be put into any type of box. I feel like creators in this generation often feel that they have to get really into a niche and and I would say yes it's true to find you know a hone in on your subject matter expertise but like Miriam you can be someone who's an expert in many subjects and she's been able to really tap into all of the things that she loves from being a mom to being you know in the kitchen with her husband and doing so many things that she loves and her community, you know, embracing um, all of the different sides of her life and her lifestyle. That is amazing. And I cannot wait to speak to Miriam about her journey and her culture. So without further ado, Miriam, welcome to Creators with Influence podcast. Please introduce yourself to the listeners that are on with us today. Sure. Um, so I was born and raised in Saudi Arabia. I moved to the U.S. when I was 12. Um, my parents are Pakistani and I lived in Pakistan for a little while as well. And then once we moved to the U.S., I lived in Atlanta. Um, I went to school in Atlanta, then I got married and I moved to New York. I lived in New York for about three years and then we moved to Dallas, Texas and found out we were expecting. Um, while I was in New York, I worked with startups for a little while. I was in the tech space and in the food space. Um, I did a lot of creative strategy. I did consulting. There was a lot of things that I did in New York and I feel like it really paved the way for um, where I am today. And I met so many cool people. Um, the opportunities were endless. And I don't think that, I feel like I was one of those people that were like in the right place at the right time. And it kind of just like the doors open and the people that paved the way for me, kind of like, you know, just created this whole space for me. Um, now I live in Dallas. I have um, one daughter. Her name is Elise, and I'm expecting another baby. Um, and we have a home here in Dallas, and we're just making it a making our family and setting our roots. <laughs> love it. I love your story just because I know you started off um, as a blogger and you've been able to transition it into product development and so many exciting things um which really you know is a testament to what career creators can do um on the pulse of the creator economy and so i'll let karsten kick it off with the first uh question can you tell us a little bit about your journey through new york and how networking has helped you establish who you've become First, I would like to say that blogging was never like the thing that I wanted to do, right? It was more of like an accident. You stumbled on like upon it and then like it just worked out. People were asking questions and it just took off. Like it just happened. And I am grateful for that opportunity. 
Um, in New York, I felt like there were a lot of people that um, are happy to extend a hand and really help you build on whatever you want to do. Um, and that's very unlikely in other places, at least in Atlanta, that's not like the community isn't as tight. Um, but in New York, there were a lot of creatives and there's a lot of people that are in higher ups who don't mind extending a hand. And when, I, when you network, people generally want to know each other and help each other. And I think that really, really helped me get to where I want to be in terms of like figuring out, is this the thing that I want to do? Um, I think it's just the type of people that live in New York. Um, when did you develop the passion for what you do for cooking or, you know, blogging or how did you transition into cooking as well? So being a content creator had a lot of phases. So when I first started out, people were obviously very interested in like, oh, you're single, but now you're like married and you moved into New York. So obviously people wanted to know how I went from being a Southern girl from Atlanta to like a New York City girl in Brooklyn. Um, and from there, you know, people wanted to know like what you're wearing, well, how, how are you doing your hair? Like what's the married life like? And from there on, I realized that as much as I liked that, as I was going through the phases in my life, the content creation aspect of my life was also changing. And I truly believe that your content online should be a true reflection of who you are offline. And I think that's what kind of made it easy for me to go through the the seasons of my life where I went from like being a beauty content creator to like then being, you know, a married couple content creator. And now like, you know, I have, I'm a mother and my content has created, it has changed to like me transitioning into motherhood, but then also sharing my love for um, cooking. And I think I get to really, really like now truly share who I've become and all the passions that I possess through my content. I love that. I know because I started following you for your food. And so I would definitely say that you're um, a multi-dimensional creator. And I feel like, you know, one of the things creators get stuck with is like, I started my social media channels doing one thing and I have to, I have to stay singular because if I don't, my community doesn't, you know, won't know how to react if I pivot. Right. And I think that like life is a roller coaster, you know, Absolutely. we're we're all never going to do just one thing. Absolutely. I think when you evolve, you know, with your the seasons of your life the content creation comes naturally. So it's not forced and you're not stuck in a box. And that's something that I've tried my best to stick to. And I think it's also because I have a really great support system that reminds me that you don't ever have to be, you know, somebody who's boxed in just in the beauty space or somebody who's boxed into like this space, you get to be who you want to be. And I think because of that, I'm able to truly showcase all parts of my life. And for those listeners who might not know, you know, your channel or your social, I would love for you to just share a little bit about, you know, your your cooking, because I mean, you'd be throwing down <laughs> some incredible recipes. Um, and how did that start? Like from mom or grandma? Where did all that develop? So I always watched my mom and my grandma like just throwing down in the kitchen. And it's a huge part of our cultural background as well. I'm Punjabi and Punjab is a province in Pakistan. And the way we express love for people is through throwing just spreads and spreads of food. Like every meal is a spread. Um, and so I grew up seeing all of that. So for me, cooking became a very therapeutic thing. And it's I'm also really excited that like Nabil also enjoys cooking. So we get to like do this together. But it all started with my mom and my grandma. And now I love hosting people. I love creating recipes. I like sharing things that make me feel nostalgic about my childhood. And then I also love sharing things that I'm making for my child. Um, so it's just like comes naturally. It's so therapeutic. And I just love making people smile and just watching their reactions when they get to try a new recipe. Um, 
It's I love true. your yeah. smile when you talk about it, right? She just like lights up. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I love food. <laughs> well, speaking of food, can you tell us some of your favorite dishes? Oh my gosh, this is a hard one. There's so many things I could just eat all day. Um, I will definitely say one of the the recipes that we've created would be Nihari pizza. Nihari is like a slow cooked um, meat stew that is very popular in Pakistan. And my husband and I like had leftovers one day and we we're like, you know, how about we turn this into a pizza? So we actually like use the Nihari to like create the pizza sauce. And then like we turn the pizza dough into a naan and it just turned out into this amazing recipe that we love giving to people like we're like come over so you can try it so you know how good it is um <laughs> lives have been changed i will say <laughs> you've got to share this we got to put it in the podcast notes for sure um so a question for you and i kind of want to backtrack to something you said earlier about um it's kind of growing with you i have a friend who said that your audience needs to grow with you and i know kiana tapped on uh some people being almost a slave to their audience where they just have to keep feeding them. Um, how have you avoided burnout um, when being a content creator? Because I feel like we often try to like be the beast and keep up with these algorithms and things, but how have you managed to uh, maintain a, a serene lifestyle throughout all of this? Oh my gosh, I wish I was that person who did not have burnout. Like when I first started, I was a content creation machine and I felt like everything needed to be recorded, everything needed to be shared. And like, you just have to put things out because you're growing. And then that was the only way people grew back then. I mean, six years ago, you know, the more you generated content, the more people followed you, the more interaction you got. But I think over time, I realized that if I'm burning out, I'm not creative anymore. You know, I'm not feeling inspired. I'm not putting out things that are of quality. So for me, it started becoming more about quality over quantity. So now if I feel like a burnout is coming up, I take a few days to kind of just let myself feel inspired again and, you know, let myself feel like I can do this again. And then I go back and I like, you know, cook a recipe and I post it and everybody's like, oh, my God, I love it. <laughs> So, um, you know, it just, I feel like you just have to take some time for yourself. The burnout is not worth it. It's not worth that growth. It's not worth your mental sanity. So I think it's just, I've learned to take my space when I need to. Love that. So speaking of online, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, I feel like the first introduction to cultures, aside from like food and travel, is online now, right? Like we mm -hmm. now have the ability to shape the uh, the way that the world is is seeing us because we're now controlling the narrative. Um, how do you approach the online content and sharing your culture with the world? So I will say that when I first started out, I was a little hesitant about sharing a lot parts of my culture and my background and that wasn't because like i was embarrassed or you know anything of that sort it was just that market was different then people didn't really care about you being inclusive or you know they wanted to know more about your background and over the years people have generally wanted to know more about you where you come from and you know your culture and they're more accepting of all of those things um so now when i share things i am like this is what you get. This is, I'm Pakistani, I'm Punjabi, I'm Muslim, you know, and I'm, I'm passing that to my daughter now. And I want her to like truly see it in motion so she can pick up on those things as well. You know, you've been a big part of our, this is Ramadan program with Samar Alabarcha. Um, we've appreciated your thought leadership there. And I think it's, you know, we're in a really special time where I think digital culture is fueling so much of our lives and people are learning to connect before they even book a ticket to go to say Pakistan, right? They're looking to creators to kind of understand, you know, what are the do's and don'ts before I get to a country? Where should I go? What food should I be eating? Mm -hmm. How should I respect um, the people there um, when I arrive? And I think that's like a beautiful thing is like, trying to break biases by learning from others 
And I think that, you know, creators have like a, a real bridge there. Right. I, and it makes it so much easier as well because people are now interested in their accepting of the differences and people are becoming more inclusive and respectful and so it becomes easy for you to be able to share those things where you know you've hit in the past you're like here all here's all of it and and people are enjoying it and tiktok is a huge like market for you see like everybody enjoying each other's culture and it's phenomenal to see there's a great article about like how tiktok has taken over like google Mm -hmm. and just the way you know, people are searching for places, which is like really fascinating. It's, it's wild. Well, I have a really great question for you. Stanford University professor and a MacArthur fellow, Dan Jarowski wrote The Language of Food and he examines how culture shapes taste. He poses questions like, why do we eat toast for breakfast or why do we toast at dinner? And I would love for you to kind of talk about, you know, the hidden languages in food. You're looking at a lot of um, packaging and you're, you know, deeply tapped into like, you know, or organic markets and all of that stuff. Where do you think like taste, creating taste from? You know, I think like probably Pakistan has like different spices and just all of that richness. I, I found that this book was really fascinating when I discovered it and I thought I would uh, try to pick your brain on it a little. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think packaging definitely makes a huge, you know, it, it plays a huge role in how you consume something. Um, for instance, like when we go to Pakistani grocery stores, there are so many different brands because, you know, like South Asian grocery stories, stores carry so many variety from the South Asia. So when you're looking at packaging, you're looking for things that you ha are familiar with when you were growing up, right? So the first thing I will ever reach for is like something that is tested and tried and true. So things like what my mom has used. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier for me to grab on the on those things. But in terms of language, and I feel like if if a packaging is not inviting and comforting, I'm more likely to just kind of walk past it. And I'm like, mm, I don't know if I want to try it right now. But if it feels like homey and it feels like, you know, it's inviting, I will be the first one to grab it. I'm like, we have to try it. Um, and I think one thing that I've learned over the years is that I do not like trying recommendations from people. <laughs> I, I don't know, every time someone has recommended something, it is, it has not been a pleasant experience. So I'm like, oh, you want me to try this? I'm going to try something completely opposite. So when I like go to H Mart or I'll go somewhere else and I'm like grabbing like Korean barbecue stuff or I'm grabbing like hot pot stuff and I'm like, so I heard that this is really good, but you know what? I'm gonna try the thing next to it. Um, and that's like, it's because it's, the packaging is inviting. It's more comfy and it's more like homey and I'm like, I need it all. Um, so I think that really, really plays a huge role in how people consume. It's like inviting and comfort and homey. Yeah, it actually sounds like um, what you're describing is like the branding, right? Like the yeah. the company's story, like the presence of it. So how important uh, would you say or what advice do you have for any digital entrepreneurs that um, haven't quite found their brand yet? I would say that starting out small is the best way to go. And I know that we overcomplicate brands and expansion based off of like, I need to have everything the right way. Um, what ends up happening in that process is that you're so focused on creating this amazing perfect brand that you lose all the other aspects of a business or a brand so it's very important for you to take your time and let your brand and like evolve with the audience that comes on or you know the consumers that come on let them pave the way for you and your brand when you're starting out um, and I think that's what I've learned with mine as well, is that I've gone through like three different rebranding processes. We're going through another one right now. And that's all because like the audience changes, you change, your brand is supposed to change. And so you kind of let every all of those things kind of pave that way for you. 
Also to uh, piggyback on that, you also mentioned, um, you know, just how the packaging makes you feel like something that feels homely. So to me, that signals like authenticity. Um, how mm -hmm. important is authenticity to you for branding? Oh my God, huge, huge, huge. Yeah. <laughs> if it doesn't seem authentic, I'm, I'm just going to walk past it. I'm just not going to try it. I need, I need to feel like this is, this is a piece of somebody's home and I, I'm taking it into my home and I'm trying it out. Where do you think in terms of, you know, you've been able to do so much with your career and I feel like you're still like just getting started, you know, what do you sort of see for yourself in the next like three years? Oh my gosh. I feel like right now, all I can think about is having a baby number two and just going through postpartum. <laughs> but <laughs> um, my goal in, in life is, you know, eventually to have you know, my own cafe and possibly having my own cooking channel or like a segment um, and maybe a cookbook, who knows? Um, so all of those things are something that I work towards whenever I, you know, do get time to actually fully sit down and do things right now. Um, but that's the ultimate goal, having, having multi channels of expressing my love for food and my life and all the people that I love in it. I definitely see you with the cooking show. I was, if you didn't say that, I was like, I mean, uh, I feel like that. Well, let everybody know. <laughs> well, Kiana, um, side note, maybe outside of this conversation, we can actually host like an actual dinner that's curated by, uh, by Miriam. Would you be yes, down? Yes. Oh would. my gosh. I would look I at dreams already coming true. You I guys. think that is a brilliant <laughs> idea. <laughs> I would love to feed all of you and I will just sit there and smile. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to sidebar on that. For sure. Um, so jumping back in, you know, I'm just trying to ask uh, a few questions for uh, some of the business listeners, uh, the small business entrepreneurs that are also tapped into us. Um, what advice would you have for anyone starting out or what are some of the business lessons that you've learned uh, from being a content creator to now a uh, a business owner, essentially. Oh my gosh. I wish somebody had said these things to me when I first started out. Um, when I first started out, people were already in the social media space, but you don't see the, the imperfections behind the closed door. So I felt like I needed to have like a professional camera. I felt like I needed to have high end things. I felt like I needed to do this and that to really fit into the social you know content creation space and then you know while i was doing the perfectionist like like when i was creating all this perfect content i realized that it wasn't resonating with people um and so i kind of backtracked and like what am i doing differently i think when people start into the space or any space the whole like your headspace goes into i need to have the best of everything to be the best at everything um, and I think that's a trap. It's a scam. You can pretty much do whatever you'd like to do with the things that you have and then invest into things as you're growing. So it wasn't until maybe like two years into content creation that I like got a professional camera. And even then my most like generated content or most relatable content was off of my iPhone or my like husband's Android. <laughs> so you know, don't fall into the trap of like investing so much money up front and falling into this trap that you need to be so perfect when you can literally do whatever you want to do with what you have. I think a lot of people don't realize that nobody really like wakes up and just starts on things, right? The reason I got lucky with creating my own space and growing as fast as I did was because my husband was supportive. We had like, you know, somebody who was like holding it down because with content creation the other thing is you it's contract based right so you're the the money is very uncertain the contracts are very uncertain when you first start so to expect like you know a paycheck every two weeks or a, like a, every month is is hard when you're first starting out so I think that I was able to do what I was able to do was because I had a supportive husband and you know a partner and family that was there in case things didn't work out. So they kind of allowed me to flourish in my own space 
and make myself who I am and gave me that security while I was doing all of this. And I don't think people kind of like really see that part. We need to be more transparent of like the climb to success. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do agree that, you know, now in my startup founder phase, you know, you have to be resourceful. You're not going to have the big budgets if you're, say, Mm -hmm. for example, like myself leaving corporate. You're going to have to tap into your network and, you know, leverage your your friends and, you know, team up on shoots and think about how you can repurpose. I'm now I'm going back in my archives and seeing what can old can become new. And I think that's, you know, what all business owners have to do is sort of like, how can you you know, have more lifeline when you know that you can't be in production because you're also like managing your finances or, you know, doing all of those um, administrative things that are part of the content creation process that we also don't talk enough about either. Absolutely. I feel like it's just such a huge part of being an entrepreneur that we don't really talk about as often as we should or are transparent about and I think it should be spoken about a little bit more question for you because you talked about family and this is something that I think most um most content creators don't really discuss either right like even in terms of like the insta husband we know who's like someone's taking these like magnificent photos when you're out on the road (laughs) but um how do you balance you know being a, a creator a mother a wife you know a daughter all of these things at once like how do you balance that I'll be honest with you. I don't think I figured out that balance. I I struggle with it till this day. It looks like I have it down. I don't. Um, I will, for me, like a lot of my content creation ends up being on the weekends because during the week, I'm kind of like, you know, doing all the housework and then I'm, you know, dropping Elise off to school. And then, you know, there's just so many things that happen during the week. And that's like my time to kind of get my life in order. And the weekend is when like, I will try to shoot content and then we go from there. But no, I wish I would like, I have, I had it down. I ideally in an ideal world, I would like to just do all of those things every single day of my life, but that's physically impossible. Um, and I can't be in like 10 places at the same time. So I've just kind of like, let it be. I'm like, if the balance is going to come to me, I'll find it eventually. But for right now, the system is working. Why change it? And as we wrap up, I mean, for all of the up and coming food creators and family entrepreneurs, what sort of words of wisdom would you impart for those who look up to you? Because I know there are so many young women who do, including myself. A lot of people love your channel and the positive messages you put up, put out. I think that you are a constant inspiration to a lot of people. Thank you. (laughs) Um, I would say I've said this when I first started and I say this now too, is that the first initial step to being an entrepreneur or, you know, being in social media space or in any space is the hardest. Once you take that initial step and you've gone over that hump, you can you can make your way through anything. Um, so like, if you if you want to like, you know, do something, just do it. I know it's easy, like easier said than done. But I promise the first initial step, like, it's just so much easier. Once you take that step, everything comes your way. Um, and you're going to have like trials and tribulations, you're going to have you know, you're not going to have enough time. You're going to be juggling two things at once. You can't really leave your job right now because you're doing your side hustle and all of those things, but you'll figure it out. Um, so have some faith, give yourself some grace and you'll get there. Can you please let the listeners know where they can find you, where they can see you and maybe where they can even contact you? I'm on TikTok. I don't know what I'm doing on TikTok. I feel like I'm so old. I keep trying and I'm like, maybe this space is not for me. It's but absolutely for everybody. <laughs> I know, but there's just like, I see so many other people and it's like hard not to get insecure on social media, right? Like even you can be like the most confident person and you'll see a creator and you're like, how do you do that? I want to do that. And 
you know, like as a content creator, seeing another content creator, you know exactly what's going on behind the door, but you still get so insecure. But anyways, I'm on TikTok, I'm on <laughs> Pinterest, and we have It's Actually Spicy YouTube channel. You can find me there and on so, so many of our recipes. Um, and you can also see my husband in all those videos. So it was so lovely talking to you guys and hopefully we get to do something together in the future. Bye, Bye darling. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Karsten, guess what? What's up, Kiana? We are on Amazon Music. Are you pulling my card? Are you pulling my strings? Are you playing games with my emotions? I sure am not. I'm so excited. As we keep growing this podcast distribution channel, we are really everywhere. And if you're not listening to Creators with Influence, you can now find us on Amazon Music and of course, where podcasts are. Kiana, you could be you could be anywhere in the world, but you're on this acoustic adventure with me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> So, as Kiana said, you can find us on all the platforms. That's Spotify. That's Amazon. That's Apple. That's everywhere Google, podcasts live. iHeartRadio. We are everywhere, baby. So there's no excuses to miss out on us. And again, thank you guys all for joining in on this journey with us. Yes, we hope you like the episodes we're serving up because we do it with heart and soul. Creators with Influence is produced by the American Influencer Council, the sole 501c6 not-for-profit trade association in the U.S. created by and for career creators.